The Presidential Election Petitions Tribunal is arguably the unending yet trending issue in Nigeria since the end of the first quarter of 2019. It is the most followed soap opera in town. Unfortunately, this melodrama portends dire consequences for the Nigerian nation. No matter how well the election is conducted, there are bound to be complaints. Hence, the law provides for the setting up of election petition tribunals to look into these complaints in a speedy manner. Although one might run the risk of being sub judice, since the matter is already in court and the actual proceedings and hearings have commenced, it is, however, imperative and incumbent on the media, whether traditional or social media, or whether international or local, to bring the facts of the case as it were to all Nigerians. The 2019 presidential elections is a process in three phases. First is the pre-election phase. This consists of the declarations, party primaries, and the entire campaign process. The second phase is the election itself. This consists of the accreditation processes, the actual voting exercise, the counting of the ballots, the collation of the results, and INEC's announcement of same. The third and final phase is the post-election phase, when the political gladiators approach the courts and tribunals if they feel aggrieved or if the results announced in the opinion of the aggrieved parties do not reflect the true will of the voting publics. The first two phases have been concluded. We are now in the third phase, the courts. There is little gain saying the fact that the contentious 2019 presidential elections affects all Nigerians directly, irrespective of geopolitical, demographic, socio-economic, socio-cultural and or political differences and persuasions. To put it mildly and in one simple phrase, all Nigerians are interested and affected parties to the case. To compound the quandary which INEX alleged questionable handling of the 2019 elections has thrown the nation into, it is the question of the impartiality of the nation's judiciary. Although INEC, President Buhari, and the APC are the official respondents in the petition filed by the PDP and its presidential candidate, Alhaji Atiku Abubakar, it has become increasingly apparent that a different party, whose conduct and adjudication as umpire and arbiter is tangential to the petition and its credible resolution, is also on trial. The Nigerian judiciary and its entire justice system is on trial. Many a Nigerian, irrespective of status, geopolitical and demographic constitution and persuasion, questions the entire judicial apparatus and its statutory impartiality. But how brave are our justices? Can the Nigerian judiciary stand up to be counted? Can the justices of the Federal Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court do the right thing? Can the men and women of the two highest courts in the land summon the courage to deliver justice on the side of the average Nigerian and do so without fear or favor? Democracy stands on a tripod of three co-equal branches of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. The judiciary is reportedly the common man's last hope. It is almost an unspoken truism that many judges in Africa seem to lack the will to confront those who wield executive power. However, in a landmark judgment in 2017, the Supreme Court of Kenya ordered a wholesale cancellation of the August 2017 presidential elections in Kenya. The presidential election held on 8 August 2017 was not conducted in accordance with the Constitution and the applicable law rendering the declared results invalid, null, and void. That judgment was a paradigm shift of seismic proportions, albeit in a continent renowned for the seeming docility of its revered men and women of the bench. The 2019 presidential election is being challenged on the grounds of monumental fraud. As much as four presidential candidates filed petitions alleging widespread irregularities and substantial no compliance with the Electoral Act. The candidates are Ambrose Owaru of the Hope Democratic Party, Jeff Chize Ojinga of the Coalition for Change, Amichi Habo of the People's Democratic Party, and Alhaji Atiku Awubaka of the People's Democratic Party, the PDP. 
of all these petitions, that of the PDP and its presidential candidate, Alhaji Atiku Abubakar, is arguably the star attraction. The five grounds upon which Atiku based his petition are as follows. 1. That the second respondent, Buhari, was not duly elected by majority of lawful votes cast at the election. 2. The election of the second respondent, Buhari, is invalid by reason of corrupt practices. 3. The election of the second respondent, Buhari, is invalid by reason of non-compliance with the provisions of the Electoral Act 2010 as amended. 4. The second respondent, Buhari, was at the time of the election not qualified to contest the said election. 5. The second respondent, Buhari, submitted to the first respondent, INEC, an affidavit containing false information of a fundamental nature in aid of his qualification for the said election. The petition is being heard before the Presidential Elections Petitions Tribunal at the Court of Appeals, who have 180 days to sit and reach a verdict. If unsatisfied, the parties to the petition are at liberty to proceed to the Supreme Court, who must reach a judgment within 90 days of the Tribunal's judgment at the Court of Appeals. The Supreme Court is the final arbiter, and its judgment and pronouncements will be final. A five-member panel of justices, which includes the President of the Court of Appeal, Her Lordship Justice Zainab Bukachua, has since begun hearing in the petitions challenging the outcome of the presidential election. But the composition of the panel by itself is a contentious issue. And in the eye of the storm is no less a person than the Chairman of the Tribunal itself, Her Lordship Justice Zainab Bukachua, the President of the Court of Appeal. Challenging the election of President Umaru Musa Yaradua in 2007, Major General Muhammadu Buhari, who contested the 2007 presidential election as the presidential candidate of the defunct All Nigeria People's Party ANPP, categorically rejected the results. He contested the election results up to the Supreme Court, who, in a 4 to 3 split decision, reaffirmed the election of the charismatic soft-spoken Umaru Musa Yaradua, who was former governor of Buhari's home state of Katsina, as president. In the words of General Buhari, now President Buhari, unquote. In 2007, I and my party, the AMPP, produced copious proof that the presidential election was rigged in the most blatant fashion. For one, ballot papers were distributed to polling stations on blank sheets of paper, making it impossible to carry out an audit trail." Unquote. Like the 2007 election, where ballot tampering was the main plank of Buhari's petition, the 2019 election witnessed the electronic tampering of both ballot counting and collation. Fortunately, the INEC server provides a forensic audit trail as claimed in the petition of the PDP and its candidate, al Haji Atiku Abubakar. However, unlike in 2007, where violence-induced rigging was at a bearable minimum, the 2019 presidential election witnessed violence-induced rigging and the systemic and brazen interference of the state's security apparatuses and agencies. These were on a monumental scale, yet unwitnessed in Nigeria since her return to civilian multi-party democracy 20 years ago. In delivering judgment on the 2007 elections that saw the emergence of Umaru Musa Yaradoa as Nigeria's president, the Supreme Court upheld Yaradoa's election. Although it acknowledged that there were irregularities during the elections, the seven-member Apex Court ruled in a split decision that the appellant, former military head of state, retired General Muhammadu Buhari of the All Nigeria People's Party ANPP, had failed to show evidence that graft was widespread enough to force an annulment. The Supreme Court justices who dismissed the 2007 petition were Chief Justice of Nigeria, Idris Kutigi, Justice Aloysius Kasina Alu, Justice Nikki Tobi, and Justice Daheru Mustafa. The dissenters who supported Buhari's petition in a minority judgment were Justice Miriam Aloma Mokhtar, Justice Walter Samuel Unkanu Onoge, and Justice George Adeshola Oguntade. In recognition of their minority judgment, the trio of former Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Aloma Miriam Mokhtar, 
former Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Oguntade, and currently embattled and suspended Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Walter Kano Onoge, were on December 24, 2008, named as the Leadership Persons of the Year by the Leadership Newspaper with the following comments. Unquote. In a period of uncertainty and probable loss of political faith, they struck a courageous blow for truth that captured and galvanized the popular imagination of Nigerians. In the face of contrived siege, they defied creeping authoritarianism and chose the road less traveled. For their fearless judicial reaffirmation that justice is the 21st century's most powerful idea for lighting a candle in darkness to show the way forward, Justices Aloma Miriam Mokta, George Oguntade, and Walter Onoge are the leadership persons of the year 2008. Unquote. It is instructive today that why Justice George Adeshola Oguntade, now retired, at the old age of 79 years, is Buhari's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. Justice Walter Samuel Nkano Onoge, however, is allegedly to have been hounded out of office as the Chief Justice of Nigeria by President Muhammadu Buhari on the eve of the 2019 presidential elections. Many believe that this was a strategic move by the President to pave the way for a judicial victory in the face of a brazenly contentious victory at the February 23rd presidential elections. On the flip side, however, the minority judgment by the trio in the 2007 presidential election Supreme Court judgment indicates that Nigerian justices, like their Kenya counterparts, have the capacity to be brave and courageous, that they indeed can restore the glory of the judiciary and galvanize the popular imagination of Nigerians, many of whom have lost faith in the nation's justice system. The justices of both the Nigeria Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court of Nigeria are at a threshold in Nigeria's history and her turbulent, tortuous journey as a democracy. It is the hope of all well-meaning Nigerians that our revered justices can, as the leadership newspaper so succinctly stated in 2008, light a candle in darkness to show the way forward for a nation whose future totters perilously on the brink. The hearing of Kenyan presidential election petition was concluded at the Supreme Court of Kenya on Tuesday, the 29th of August 2017, well after 9 p.m., but barely 28 days after the conduct of the same elections. This is in sharp contrast to Nigeria's, where the Court of Appeal has 180 days to sit, and if the case goes to the Supreme Court, it has a further 90 days within which to reach a judgment. The Kenyan Supreme Court judges had the following issues for determination as crafted by the court. 1. Whether the 2017 presidential election was conducted in accordance with the principles laid down in the Constitution and the law relating to elections. 2. Whether there were irregularities and illegalities committed in the conduct of the 2017 presidential election. 3. If there were irregularities and illegalities, what was their impact, if any, on the integrity of the election? 4. What consequential orders, declarations, and reliefs should this court grant, if any? The Kenyan Supreme Court reached a majority decision, with two judges dissenting. Four justices gave a majority ruling, while two justices gave a minority judgment. Kenya Supreme Court thus issued a declaration that the presidential election held on the 8th of August 2017 was not conducted, unquote, in accordance with the Constitution and the applicable law, rendering the declared result invalid, null, and void, and issued an order directing the Kenya Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, IEBC, to, unquote, organize and conduct a fresh presidential election in strict conformity with the constitution and the applicable election laws within 60 days. The presidential election held on 8th August 2017 was not conducted in accordance with the constitution. The first respondent failed, neglected or refused to conduct the presidential election in a manner consistent with the dictates of the Constitution and the inter alia, the Elections Act, Chapter 7 of the Laws of Kenya. Nigeria is often times referred to as the giant of Africa. 
it is the most important and most powerful nation in the West African sub-region. Kenya is Nigeria's counterpart in East Africa and perhaps the most important in that sub-region. Kenya is similar to Nigeria in several ways. Like Nigeria, Kenya was a British colony. Both countries had contact with Europe and the Middle East, dating back to the early modern period. The Portuguese got to the Bight of Benin and the Gulf of Guinea, as well as areas along the coast of what is now Nigeria, in the 1450s. On the other hand, the Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama reached Mombasa, now Kenya's largest port city, in 1498. The British declared the colony in Lagos in 1861, thus beginning Nigeria's colonial journey, which culminated in the amalgamation of the British protectorates of southern and northern Nigeria into one colonial entity in 1914. The British Empire established the East Africa Protectorate in 1895, a territory which became known as Kenya in 1920. Nigeria became an independent nation under the British crown in 1960 and a republic in 1963. Kenya gained independence from Britain in 1963 and became a republic in 1964. Kenya's journey to independence was a tortuous one and the Mau Mau uprising between 1952 and 1956 was a key watershed. The British suppression of the Mau Mau revolt led to the constitutional debates which, like in Nigeria, culminated in the granting of independence to Kenya in 1963. While Nigeria is a nation of more than 350 ethnic nationalities, Kenya is also a multi-ethnic nation with as many as 42 ethnic groupings living in the country. In the past, ethnic minority groups were often neglected in terms of development. But in 2012, Kenya implemented a new constitution that protects the rights of minority groups. The largest ethnic groups in Kenya include the Kikuyu with 22%, Luya with 14%, Luo with 13%, Kalenji with 12%, Kamba with 11%, Mero with 6%, while several other African tribes and groups as well as Arab, Indian and other Asian tribes and white Europeans make up 21%. On the other hand, the large ethnic groups in Nigeria may include the Hausa with 21%, Yoruba 21%, Igbo 18%, Ijo 10%, Fulani 3.9%, Kanuri 4%, Ibibio 3.5%, Tivi 2.5%, Waidi Edo, Ibira, Bagi, Juku, Igala, Urobo and all other groups make up 12%. Apart from a shared and common colonial history and heritage, Nigeria and Kenya share constitutional, political and legal similarities. Voting in Kenya as in Nigeria is via universal adult suffrage, where any bona fide citizen is eligible to vote on attaining the age of 18 years. The legal system in Nigeria and Kenya Kenya, like Nigeria, operates a mixed legal system. Nigeria operates English common law, Islamic law in 12 northern states, and traditional or customary law. Likewise, Kenya, who operates the English common law, Islamic law, and the customary law, executive branch of government. Both countries run American-style presidential systems of government, where the president is the nation's chief executive. In both countries, the president is both chief of state and head of government. In Kenya, as in Nigeria, the Cabinet of Ministers or the Federal Executive Council is appointed by the President, subject to confirmation by the National Assembly. The Nigerian and Kenyan legislative branches are similar. They both have a bicameral legislature or National Assembly, which in the case of Nigeria consists of a Senate with 109 seats, three each for the 36 states and one for the Federal Capital Territory Abuja and the House of Representatives with 360 seats. Similarly, the Kenyan legislature consists of a Senate with 67 seats, 47 members are elected directly in single-seat constituencies by simple majority vote, and 20 are directly elected by proportional representation, out of which 16 represents women, 2 represents the youth, and 2 represents the disabled. 
Kenya's lower house or national assembly has 349 seats. 290 members are elected directly in a single seat constituencies by simple majority vote. 47 women in single seat constituencies elected by simple majority vote and 12 members nominated by the National Assembly, six representing youth and six representing the disabled. Now, in the judicial branch of government, the highest court in Kenya, as in Nigeria, is the Supreme Court of Kenya. It consists of a Chief Justice and a Deputy Chief Justice and five other justices. Kenya's Chief Justice serves a single, non-renewable term of 10 years or until the age of 70, whichever comes first. Other judges serve until the age of 70 years. The Nigerian Supreme Court consists of the Chief Justice and 15 other justices, and like in Kenya, Nigeria judges also serve until 70 years when they must retire. The economy. Nigeria is arguably one of the largest economies in sub-Saharan Africa and relies heavily on oil as its main source of foreign exchange earnings and government revenues. Since 2008-2009, Nigeria's economic growth has been driven by growth in agriculture, telecommunications and services. On the flip side, however, economic diversification and strong growth are yet to translate into significant decline in poverty levels, with over 62% of Nigeria's 190 million people still living in extreme poverty. Kenya, on the other hand, is the economic, financial and transport hub of East Africa. Kenya's real GDP growth has averaged over 5% for the last eight years. Since 2014, Kenya has been ranked as a lower medium income country because its per capita GDP crossed a World Bank threshold. Why Kenya has a growing entrepreneurial middle class and steady growth, its economic and development trajectory is largely impaired by weak governors and corruption, just as in Nigeria. Unemployment and underemployment are extremely high in Kenya and could be near 40% of its 50 million people. It must be stated clearly that the political process of elections isn't over until the elections tribunal phase is over. And the main thrust of an election petition is to show substantial non-compliance with the electoral laws which led to the wrongful declaration of a winner. The scenario that played out in Kenya in 2017 that precipitated the courageous and wholesale cancellation of that election by the Supreme Court of Kenya is largely similar to what is currently playing out in Nigeria today. The Kenya judges averred that the election results was declared before all results from the nation's 40,000 polling stations have been received. This they claimed practically disenfranchised the citizens in these areas. That was a material infringement on the rights of Kenyans and against the Kenyan constitution. Similarly, due to violence and other forms of disturbances, elections did not hold in various states, wards, and polling units in Nigeria on February 23rd. This led to the scheduling of a supplementary election for March 9, about 10 days after announcing a supposed winner. At the time INEC announced the results of the presidential elections, there were noticeable flawed figures, overvoting, irreconcilable figures that were pointed out, yet these were considered not an infraction on the constitutional provisions for a credible election. In the case of Kenya, the petitioner, the NASA coalition led by its candidate Raila Odinga, argued that the IEBC attempted to rig President Uhuru Kayata into office. The proof of this, they alleged, existed inside the IEBC servers. They also argued that Form 34, which is used for tallying the election results, were not standardized, with some forms lacking watermarks and or serial barcodes. The Kenya electoral umpire, IEBC, claimed that they had technical difficulties and were unable to assess the servers. They went on to explain that the IEBC was simply unable to assess their own servers at short notice as they were relying on the French company that hosts the servers. The servers are in Europe. We had to wait for them to start working 
they have to set up the access window with safeguards. That exercise is going on. Deputy Chief Justice Nwilu stated that the fact that the technical difficulties caused the server access to be delayed raised enough suspicion in and of itself to overturn the entire presidential election. Critical areas leaves us with no option but to accept the petitioner's claims that the IEBC's IT system was infiltrated. First, the Supreme Court of Kenya granted the petitioner's prayers and instructed that the IEBC servers be opened up for public scrutiny. In Nigeria, the PDP and its candidate claim strongly that the results of the election were transmitted electronically to the INEC servers. According to Atiku Aubaka, the authentic results as captured by the server showed that he defeated the candidate of the APC, Muhammadu Buhari, with over 1.6 million votes. To prove this, Atiku wants the commission to tender before the election petition tribunal the results it had in its server before it allegedly decided to wipe them off. This is one of the reliefs that Atiku is seeking in court. Atiku's reliance on the Independent National Electoral Commission server is supported by the declarations which the commission made before and after the elections. Before the election, the chairman of the commission, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, told Nigerians that results will be transmitted electronically to the server in order to ensure transparency and authenticity. To deploy in the 2019 general elections a new platform for electronic collation and transmission of results. Mamou's declaration was his own way of allaying the fears of Nigerians who might have been displeased that President Buhari declined to sign into law the Electoral Amendment Bill which provides for electronic transmission of results. In line with Mahmoud's assurances, INEC is widely believed to have transmitted the results to the INEC server via the smart card readers on election day. This fact was further collaborated by Mr. Festo Sokoye, the chairman of Information and Voter Education Committee of INEC, and Mikey Guinea, one of the commission's commissioners who affirmed even after the election that the commission transmitted results to his servers electronically. Just as in Kenya, the PDP and his candidate, Atiku Abubakar, in their petition, alleged that there were discrepancies on very large scales at the various levels of recording and collation of the results, particularly between the polling units level and the ward collations level. They claimed that INEC wrongly and deliberately entered wrong results in favor of Buhari and the APC in at least 11 states, namely Borno, Yobe, Bauchi, Gombe, Jigawa, Kaduna, Kanu, Katsina, Kebi, Ninja, and Zamfara states. In one breath, INEC assured all Nigerians that results were transmitted electronically to its server. In another, it denies the same, insisting that results were only transmitted manually, claiming its servers are empty. The question that must be asked is, if the INEC servers were truly empty, why will it worry over the verification of the contents of the servers? Even if empty, the contents of the servers should be made public. Nigerians own the election. It is their right and in their interest to know the contents of the servers. The historical, political, governmental, legal, as well as economic comparisons between Nigeria and Kenya are necessitated by the need to properly situate the narrative that if the Kenyan Supreme Court can do it, the justices of both the Appeal Court and the Supreme Court of Nigeria surely can. The 2019 presidential election petition and the unprecedented number of the more than 780 other election petitions filed before the different election tribunals at all levels across the country as a fallout of the 2019 general elections presents the Nigerian judiciary the lifetime opportunity to rise from its own ashes and redeem itself, the rule of law, and by extension, the Nigerian nation. It took the Kenyan Supreme Court barely four weeks to enter a verdict. It eschewed political considerations and delivered judgment on the points of law, even though it risked the anger of powerful cliques of the political elite and supporters of the incumbent.
by that first September 2017 landmark judgment in Nairobi, the East African nation of Kenya, previously famous for her safaris, picturesque landscapes, long-distance runners, and Maasai areas, rewrote the history of democracy in Africa. Fairness, equity, integrity. The petition might have been filed by Atiko and the PDP against Buhari, APC, and INEC, but it is the judiciary in Nigeria that is ultimately on trial. When we say Igu Beta, Nigerians believe in the ethos of destiny working its magic and things working out in our favor. Just like the Kenyan phrase, Hakuna Matata, which means no worries, a phrase made globally popular by the Disney film The Lion King. As we await the verdict of the justices, Nigerians hope and pray that Igu Beta and as the Kenyans will say, Hakuna Matata, no worries, be happy.